as said, so we're very excited to have her perspective. Um, we also have me, you guys all know me, and um, Lauren Cohen, who's a, a program manager, program manager for Picornet, and also a project leader in the Pragmatic Health Systems Research Group here. Um, so hopefully some diversity of perspectives, and uh, we'll have a hopefully a good discussion at the end of our um, each of our four talks. So we'll start things off with Dr. Tracy Wong. Please join me in welcoming her today. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us here. I'm going to get us all started first. Um, I can't advance the slide. Let's see if that works better. Am I, do, I supposed to do something that also advances this slide, or do they advance together at some that point? One that one stays? Yeah. Got it. OK. Huh. It's really not wanting to advance, so I'm going to leave that here. and bring that over. All right, so um, we wanted to focus the session a little bit on electronic health records because this is an area that we've gotten very, very interested in in the last several years, as you've probably heard from many of these research forum um, conversations that we've been having. Why do we want to look at electronic health data? And I think many of these are very intuitive to all of us. This, uh, these are data that are ready made. And so we can query a number of things. For example, we can find out if uh, what we want to study is actually relevant in this particular population. Uh, what kind of population should we be going for? Um, what kind of endpoints should we plan our studies around and whether or not those endpoints can actually be ascertained from the records? Um, how feasible would the enrollment uh, be if we try to launch a study population, uh, a study within this particular population? And at the end of the day, how do our results really apply from our study um, to the general population that we're very interested in looking at? So these, I think, are many of the questions that many of you in the room have thought about uh, over the last several years, particularly as we think about these large data sources. Now, many of you have already heard about PCORnet um, as something that we do here at DCRI that is really focused on how we can pragmatically embed trials within our practices. And EHRs are definitely one of our go-to data sources for something like that. Um, what we are getting better on, and originally the slide had some italics on the last two bullet points, because we're not quite there yet. At the end of the day, we want to really be able to truly embed research into our practice. So for example, if I'm seeing a patient in clinic, I should be able to think about these patients, each and every one of them, as being someone that um, might be interested in research and might be someone that we could engage in research either actively or passively. Um, many of you have heard this. Google does that with us on a daily basis. So why should we not be applying that principle in, for the purposes of improving how we do things, improving how we take care of patients? And then ultimately, at the end of the day, shouldn't we be using the electronic health record to help Help us disseminate the results. Right now, our gold standard is publication. You put it in a journal and you hope someone picks up the journal and reads it. But what if we are able to engage our patients and our providers in our study results and disseminate and implement those results directly into the electronic health record? So that's an area that I think we are all trying to work towards. Let's go back to the research trial question. And I think one of the things we really want to emulate is our colleagues in Sweden, for example. So they were able to take a clinical registry, something where consecutive procedures are entered into this registry, and they were able to embed a clinical trial as part of that. And what you do, and it doesn't even matter what kind of clinical trial you do, oh, that didn't turn out very well. I'm going to go back. It didn't come out to the front. Hmm, the formatting got screwed up. Sorry about that. But if you look at the two curves, the blue curve and the red curve, it would be nice if actually we could be able to look at the picture a little bit more carefully. There we go. OK. So if you're able to look at that, the blue curve is all the patients who underwent primary PCI in that registry. And the red curve is all the patients who ended up being part of the trial. Now, in the US, if this, was a, if this was a curve we did in the US, the blue curve would be up there, and the red curve would be right down here somewhere. OK, 
because only 3% of our patients participate in clinical trials. So we need to be able to do something to be able to change that. Let's go back to presentation mode. There you go. So what we want to do is take a look at how good our electronic health records are, are right now in their current status for being able to do research trials. And since we're the DCRI and we already have quite a bit of data in place, one of the things we did was make the investment and in to be able to say, let's take some of our data sources and compare them. And so I'm going to provide a little bit of an introduction to the data sources that uh, we used here and then turn it over to our talented group of people who've really been able to help us delve into these data. So first is NCDR. How many in the room have heard of NCDR before? Good, lots of us. This is something that we've been playing with for more than a decade in terms of data. Um, we've been working with the American College of Cardiology to do this. This is a, one of the registries that I cut my teeth on when I was a fellow coming here. This is a registry that really focuses on the inpatient hospital course. It's a quality improvement registry, so there was no need for informed consent. But the data collection stops at the hospital door. Once the patient leaves the hospital, we have no way to follow that patient because we didn't consent that patient to keep going. This is Translate ACS. How many folks in the room have worked on Translate ACS? A good subgroup of us. Great. This is a study that we did here, which was built on the NCDR um, the format, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. But now we're crossing from the inpatient into the outpatient space. So this is, um, and in order to be able to do that, we needed to consent patients to be part of our study, our registry study, to be able to follow them long term. Underneath of that are things like Explorus and things like PCORnet, and we'll go into these in a, deep, in a little bit more detail, but these are our EHR comparators here. Um, and these are something that obviously don't require patient consent because these are data that are captured from um, routine clinical care. And so let's talk a little bit about this. So NCDR started in 1998. Um, it has consecutive procedures for all PCI percutaneous coronary in, uh, in, uh, interventions that are, that are done at institutions of varying size all over the US. So these are large academic institutions like here at Duke across the street, or these are community institutions as well. This currently represents somewhere along the lines of 4,000 to 5,000 hospitals across the US. And so because this is a large endeavor, it captures about 5 million or so PCI patients. And as I mentioned, it did not involve informed consent. The data collection form is shown here. This is a screenshot of one. So this actually takes a dedicated coordinator to, on a daily basis, go in and fill out each and every one of these fields. And there are about five, six pages of this. The latest version has 10 pages on it. Okay, So manual data abstraction. There is a good amount of investment in training. We need to train people to enter the right data in. There's a good amount of investment in quality control. So uh, when the data is entered, there's some quality control there. But we also do site queries and things like that to make sure that the data is um, great. We can really penetrate that topic um, with intensity. But we can only do it in very, very focused areas. So this is one that's focused purely on the PCI. Um, so it's not really scalable to be able to do this across therapeutic areas unless we make that kind of investment. And we basically tell coordinators or data abstractors to go by the instructions. This is an example of what an instruction page looks like and say, does this variable um, fit this particular patient? Yes, no. And the abstractor puts that data in. It's a very manual process. When we did translate, we said to the, the folks, OK, well, we're going to capture patients when they had an MI treated with a PCI during their hospital stay. And then we're going to consent them for longitudinal follow-up. And then we have a, follow, a fabulous follow-up team here that said, we don't need the patient to come back to the enrolling hospital. We'll call the patient at home and find out how they're doing. And then we'll chase down all the events. And being able to do that, we were able to answer some pretty important questions about how these patients are treated over time. Mm -hmm. um, we still required a manual data abstraction 
But one of the efficiencies we did was to say, hey, look, the large majority of these fields, this is page one of the data collection form, are grayed out because we already collected that data in NCDR. They're already submitting that data. There really isn't a need to reduplicate that effort here. So everything that they fill out already for NCDR, we, we blanked out for them. So they only really needed to fill out the things that NCDR didn't collect. So that was an efficiency on, on that standpoint, something like that. All right. And then beyond that, we were really able to collect some really, really good information about the patient. So we were able to collect things like patient reported outcomes. We were able to really probe some of the lifestyle questions that they might have had, medication adherence or medical knowledge questions that might have had. And then alongside that, we had our typical trials adjudication type of process to make sure that we knew what was happening to that patient. We weren't relying on the patient to tell us that they had a heart attack. Um, by the way, if you ask the patient, did you have a heart attack, and you validated that against what we actually know about the patient for event adjudication, you'd think that a patient would know when they've had a heart attack, but really only a third of them are correct when they say they did. Um, same thing for a stroke. So this is why we still do some of these adjudication things um, here. Finally, from an electronic health record standpoint, um, we're going to showcase two here. One is Explorus, and the other one's Picornet. Um, Explorus, this is a commercial cloud-based um, database that aggregates data from a number of sources, including electronic health records, adjudicated payer claims, practice management systems, and laboratory systems. And currently, as this commercial entity, it covers about 23 typically pretty large, we think, integrated health systems that covers about 400 hospitals across the US. And um, they use a number of mapping techniques, but um, the diagnoses can be mapped to SNOMED, for example. You've probably seen this slide before. This is, um, this is a slide that Picornet and Lauren put together for me. Thank you very much. Um, that really shows a lot of the data sets that are currently available for us to be thinking about using. And I've highlighted Explorus down here, Picornet up top, so that you can really look at this. Um, in many ways, they are very, very similar if you want to think about these data sets uh, in terms of the landscape. Um, on the x-axis is the integration of the data, and the y-axis is the scalability of the network. You find that both Explorers and Picornet are up there in terms of the optimal uh, types of data networks that we're hoping to continue to cultivate um, within our uh, current um, research armamentarium. So, with that in mind, what I've, uh, well, the group here is going to do today is to really take some of the questions that we have when we think about electronic health records um, and apply that to research in terms of what are some of its strengths and what are some of its weaknesses. And I think we can all learn from that in terms of thinking about future research endeavors with electronic health records. Thank you. With that, I'm going to ring Lisa up. You're right. Is this better? OK. Everybody nods. So OK, so Tracy has set me up nicely to talk about a project we undertook to compare the Explorus database, or a population created using the Explorus database, to a couple of clinical registries that we have d here at DCRI, which Tracy has already described. Before I jump into um, showing you some of what we found, it's important to acknowledge the statistical team that really did a very nice job on this project. AJ Overton and Derek, Derek Sear are both here. Um, Amanda Brucker, I think, probably could not make it today. We also worked with Devera Gabriel in informatics and Lisa Colton back in outcomes. So it was a great team. Thanks, guys. 
So the goal of the project was to compare the two uh, registries that you've heard about, so CAFPCI pci and Translate ACS, to the population created um, using the Explorers database. We, um, as I, I think Tracy mentioned, Translate ACS is a, is a population of patients who were admitted for acute MI. They then went under, underwent um, PCI and also received um, ADP inhibitors. So what we did was we cut the CATH PCI um, registry down to that population as well and restricted it to the acute MI population. We also applied the same criteria to the Explorus database to create a, to kind of try to rep replicate that population. So we then compared the populations in terms of data availability, baseline characteristics, some of the characteristics that were measured at the index hospitalization, and then we also took a look at some follow-up data to see how we did. And, and I'd like to say at this point that we were working with a team from IBM who had a lot of insight into the data and were really um, very collaborative and very helpful in terms of uh, just really understanding how, how they pull the data together. Um, and we were, and their, their interest and ours also was to really gain some insight into how useful this database is to answer research questions. They also were interested in obtaining feedback from us on ways that they could improve their platform. So as I mentioned, we, we cut down that Explorus population to, to replicate the, the, um, the Translate population. Um, so we started with a cut that the Explorus team took for us, where they restricted this huge population to um, patients with a, a diagnosis of uh, cardiovascular disease. And they were using a SNOMED code for that. We then took that and cut it down to patients who were admitted for an acute MI. So they were, it was an inpatient admission. Acute MI we defined using ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. Uh, we also, to um, have unique encounters for, for particular patients, we took only the first, um, the first encounter that we saw for a particular patient. And note that we're not trying to get at incident events, but just the first one that we saw in the, in the database. So we then cut that population down to um, patients with a code for a PCI. And PCI, we again defined using ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. We also use CPT codes. So the first thing that struck us here was that we only saw 34% of those patients admitted for acute MI who had a PCI associated with the event and, or the encounter. And so we really dug in and tried to figure out why that was, because we, were, we would have expected to see a higher rate. And so we looked at things like um, windows, like because initially we had done it by encounter ID, and we thought maybe there was a problem with uh, um, defining a particular encounter. So we looked at, at event window or um, time windows. We also looked at, um, at the codes that we used. And we did some sensitivity analyses using SNOMED codes. And none of those things budged it at all. That, and that was kind of, I think of that as looking at the numerator, right? We're trying to identify those PCI events. We also tried to get at the denominator and really try to characterize the population that we found in the, this acute MI population. And we ran into some challenges there. I mean, you can imagine as the Explorer, as IBM is aggregating all this data across different health systems, the governance issues are non-trivial. So they have to, they enter into a lot of agreements and, and constrain their data in ways to protect privacy. And so some of the things that we really would have liked to have looked at to understand the context of the data weren't there. We couldn't see individual hospitals, for example. You couldn't tell which patient, patients came from which hospitals. We couldn't see hospital size. We couldn't see rural versus urban or tertiary center versus community hospital. Or some of those things that you know, those of us with epidemiology training really like to see when we're trying to, to understand the data. So we took it as it was, so that 34% of, of AMI encounters in which there was a PCI, and then we went on and looked at um, the availability of drug information. And you can imagine patients admitted for acute MI who underwent PCI have probably had some medications at some point during that encounter. We found that 80% of the, of the encounters had associated medications data. But then we did encouragingly find that for those who did have the medications data available, 95% of them showed signs of, or there was information suggesting a, um, a prescription for ADP inhibitors in, in the data set associated with that encounter. And that's about what you would expect, 95% or probably even upwards of that for, for these patients. 
Um, we then applied the age restriction, which didn't make a whole lot of difference. We then restricted the population to patients with some kind of information about medical history. And you know, you kind of, when you do this sort of thing, we, we did it because we wanted to be able to characterize well the population in terms of their, their history and their characteristics at the index hospitalization. You also worry about selection, right? I mean, we're looking at, if we're looking at prior diagnoses, then we're picking out the people who've had some kind of encounter with the health system before that. So they may be sicker, they may be a little different. We also tried to grab information available at the index hospitalization. So we looked at medical history collected at the visit, and we also looked at the problem list. What we found is that, when we, that prior diagnoses were available in 99%. So almost all of the cases where we found some kind of medical history information, that information came from prior visits, from prior diagnoses. And then the medical history collected at the visit and also the um, uh, problem list were only available about 15 to 20% of the time. Now, it was encouraging to see that that was increasing over time. I mean, it was as low as 5% in 2010 and then increased for an overall rate of, of uh, 15 to 25, 15 to 20% availability. So you can see the data improving over time as hospitals are coming online, as people are getting used to working with these electronic health record systems and you, know, you can only Imagine things will get better as we go. So we were left with a sample size of 23,640. Am I, can you still hear me? I feel like, okay, great. Okay, so then we dug in and took a look at the characteristics of these populations, starting with demographics and, and clinical characteristics. And we found that the explorers population lined up really nicely with the CAF PCI population. And if you recall, both of these populations, what they have in common is the, the lack of conform, informed consent. So translate ACS patients had to consent to participate and had to consent for the follow-up. And so we do see, as we look at the, at the characteristics at the index hospitalization, things look a little more lined up between the two where there was no consent. So demographics, all three of them lined up pretty well. We did see that the um, translate ACS population was a little bit younger. We also see as we look at some of these prior diagnoses and prior procedures that the rate of prior diagnoses and prior procedures is lower, a little lower in the translate ACS population. They seem to be a little bit healthier. A notable exception here is cabbage. Prior cabbage, which you'll see only 4.3% in the explorers population, uh, much higher rates in the, in the two registries. Okay, so then we also looked at presentation medication, uh, discharge medications in labs. So presentations, so these are STEMI, cardiac arrest, cardiogenic shock, and then some um, measurements taken at the visit. It was a little more variable. We saw kind of things were a little uh, less consistent across the three populations. For medications, so that, that got interesting. So in, ex in the Explorus database, we identify medications by prescriptions. So we can't see fills and we can't see if it was, act, you know, it was actually being used. And of course, this is common in um, electronic health record systems. But we were interested in aspirin for this particular population. And you can see that in CAS PCI and Translate, almost everybody was getting aspirin at discharge. In um, Explorus, it was as low as 63%, probably reflecting the fact that most people don't get prescribed aspirin. And so we just weren't able to catch it in this database. We also saw lower rates of the ADP um, inhibitors, uh, the AD, AD, sorry, the ADP inhibitors um, in Explorus than we did in the two registries. And that's, that is a little bit surprising, as we would expect most of these patients to be receiving these prescriptions at, at this um, hospitalization. Labs lined up pretty nicely across all three populations. So then we looked at event rates at 30 days and 365 days post-discharge. And there are a few things to think about as we're interpreting these results. First one is we're not looking at CAF PCI because there is no follow-up data. We also face some challenges in defining availability for follow-up and follow-up time. So recall what Tracy described in terms of the follow-up for the translate population. I think you said there was a fabulous follow-up team chasing after these patients, calling them, interviewing them, finding out 
where they, you know, if they had had events and then validating it against the, you know, the hospitals where they said they had been and, and, and having an adjudication. And compare that to the Explorers population where obviously this is not, there's no active follow-up here. Nobody's chasing after these guys. So we're looking in the medical record and we're looking for some sign of an encounter with the health system. Now that's, there are pluses and minuses to that approach, right? Because you want to know that your denominator is somebody who is, is around. They haven't gone off and moved away and received their care somewhere else, or they haven't died. And that raises one other challenge we found with the Explorus database, which is typical, I think, of many electronic health record systems, which is that we don't see deaths unless the death occurred in the hospital or unless the patient, I guess the patient wouldn't have called if they died, but if their relatives let their provider know and then that was noted in the medical record somewhere that, um, that there was a death. So we know that the death data is incomplete, although I would note that IBM is planning to use the um, obtained data from the Social Security master death, master death file and incorporate that into their database. But for now, we know it's incomplete. So we have this incomplete death ascertainment. We, we're um, conditioning on patients having some kind of contact with the health system, and we worry that that biases our results, right? People who are in contact with the health system tend to be sicker, and so maybe that's going to bias our results somewhere. But at the same time, it also doesn't guarantee that we're seeing those events. Somebody could have contact with the health system but very easily go somewhere else for, to have their heart attack or stroke. So we kind of, you know, we, we kind of went with this and, and we're thinking that um, really these patients who have just had a heart attack really should be having contact with the health system. We can, we can assume that it's probably a, a fairly reasonable assumption that they're going to be back. But that is something to think about as we're interpreting these results. So all that said, I would also add that MACE, which as we know includes death, we understand is probably undercounted because we're not seeing all the deaths. We also um, need to acknowledge that unplanned re revascularizations in the Explorus population, we can't see if it's planned or not. So this is all revascularizations. And so despite all that, we're seeing that consistently across all endpoints, the, um, the event rates are much higher in the Explorus population than in the other populations. And so, you know, we have all these caveats that I've mentioned. We also are thinking about the fact that um, it can be hard to identify a particular encounter. So you could have multiple contacts with the health system that really are all part of one encounter. And we're seeing those different data streams within the, da the, in, within the Explorers database. And so it's possible that something that was actually one encounter shows up as multiple encounters in the database. So to try to get around that, we implemented a washout period. And that's what the second column is. And you can see that it didn't really make a big difference. We still have those high event rates relative to the translate population. So then finally, that leads me to the, the last point, which is we did see, when we looked at the baseline characteristics, the translate population looked a little bit healthier than, than the explorers population. So maybe it is reasonable that their event rates are higher. And our challenge is that we don't really know for sure where, where the differences lie. So finally, what have we learned from this? So as I've mentioned, um, we've, we've, the EHR population, the Explorers population, replicated our registries reasonably well. Uh, we did see the higher event, event rates in the Explorers population. Um, we have, and this is true in any EHR database, we always have these challenges with knowing, did, did we not see events because Patients didn't come in or there was no event to see. Um, and then data availability. I mentioned some of the, the variables that we really would have liked to have seen in the Explorers database. Some of them are going to be added and some um, probably not yet. And then we think about what is, this, what is this database useful for? I mean, it is, as Tracy described, a very powerful, convenient way of getting at, at data collected in the course of clinical care. And it's got to be useful for something, right? And, and we think it is. We think that um, it's good for looking at burden, burden of disease kinds of questions. It's useful for looking at treatment prevalence and provider practice patterns, but really in the situation where you're not so much interested in thinking about follow-up and um, thinking about duration or persistence of care, but more of a cross-sectional kind of look. Um, and then of course, analysis of research feasibility, which I think Tracy touched on as well. 
Okay, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Emily. Great. Um, so, so thanks, Lisa and Tracy. I think it's a really um, nice setup for for my talk on um, orbit. Um, actually, a lot of the lessons learned are, are similar in um, in my work and in, in or uh, Lisa's work. So, um, I'll try not to be too repetitive. Um, but essentially, we were interested in um, doing a sort of sort of similar thing um, using an outpatient a registry for atrial fibrillation. And if you've been to research forum this year um, and you hadn't worked in AFib before, you're likely getting a good understanding of the population health burden of this condition. Um, it's the most common cardiac arrhythmia and results in a five-fold increase in the risk of ischemic stroke. And people who have strokes and have AFib have um, more severe strokes and are, are at higher risk for mortality and recurrent stroke relative to other stroke survivors without AFib. Um, so we're always, always interested in data sources that we can use to better understand the contemporary treatment patterns and um, risk factors in this population. So we're really excited about the opportunity to do this and explore this. Um, so uh, essentially, we, uh, we compared the demographics, um, clinical characteristics, adverse event risk and AF management patterns um, in the Explorers database compared with um, a registry that is here at the DCRI that many of you are um, familiar with called Orbit. Um, it's a national prospective outpatient registry that enrolled patients from 2010 to 2011. Um, about two years of follow-up on average with visits every six months to collect information on medication use and uh, clinical events and any new diagnoses. Um, sites were, were selected to be broadly representative geographically and also to represent a mix of provider specialties including EP, cardiology, and primary care. And we ended up with about 10,000 patients for, um, for this analysis from Orbit. So um, our, our population derivation is actually quite a bit simpler than the one that Lisa described, thankfully. But we started with this very broad heart disease population data set that was um, identified by Explorus um, and limited to patients with at least one outpatient encounter in uh, the 2009 to 2015 time period. So this is about 4.4 million. Um, then uh, limited to those with at least one presentation indicating a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation from 2010 to 2013. Uh, dropped people with AFib secondary to reversible condition. And then consistent with some of the prior validation work that we've done in claims data sets required um, two presentations within a single year indicating atrial fibrillation to try to get a more specific population that we could be pretty sure um, actually had atrial fibrillation. Um, and so this left us with about 140,000 patients for analysis. So um, the, the demographics um, in the, the two groups, we, we actually were pretty struck by the comparability. And, and one thing that I'll say is that um, it, it was never our, our hypothesis that these characteristics would look exactly the same, right? Um, as, as Lisa mentioned, with um, these cohort studies and registry studies that require informed consent and um, where, where patients are, are sampled from a selected group of sites, you're really not expecting to see a group that, that is truly representative of a broader population. So we, we were really um, struck by how comparable the demographics were here, similar median age, um, gender and race distributions. And uh, similarly, the, the medical history burden actually look, looked quite comparable as well. Um, similar prevalence of hypertension and diabetes with slightly higher rates of um, previous GI bleed, stroke, um, TIA or thromboembolism, as well as heart failure and CAD. Um, and a slightly higher proportion of patients in the Explorers population who um, met this chads vasc of two or greater threshold, which is the indication for oral anticoagulation for stroke prophylaxis, uh, versus 72 percent in the uh, orbit population. Um, treatment patterns, as, as Lisa mentioned, I think are, are a good use of, of this data set to, to look at how many patients are receiving a guideline recommended medical therapy. Um, slightly lower proportion who are receiving antiplatelets in Explorus uh, compared with Orbit, again, um, possibly due to this issue with aspirin being over the counter and, and maybe not being um, documented as consistently. Um, Lower proportion treated with warfarin, about 45% in Explorers versus 71% in Orbit. And then um, the in, in terms of the, the NOAC use, slightly higher use of dabigatran in Explorers versus um, Orbit. And because of the time period for enrollment, we didn't have information on Rivaroxaban or Apixaban in Orbit since they were just coming to market. 
So um, stroke uh, stroke events, um, this, this was a challenge for us, um, as, as Lisa mentioned, due to the lack of information about death um, and censoring, we, we didn't feel comfortable really calculating a, a person time that we could use in the denominator for um, for this group. So we, we didn't even try to calculate event rates, um, but we did look at the, the total proportion of patients who experienced a stroke event. It's about uh, 16,000 patients in Explorus, um, and this uh, tracked pretty consistently with what we would expect due to Chad's VAS score. Um, and similarly with major bleeding, about 48,000 patients out of the 140 who experienced a major bleeding event. This is a, for a median uh, time from confirmatory diagnosis to last encounter of about four years. So it gives us a very um, general sense of the, the uh, annual bleeding rate um, and actually pretty comparable proportions of patients who experience major bleeding events by risk score. So um, in conclusion, uh, we were uh, struck by the, the comparability of the comorbidity distribution in the two populations. Um, lower use of antithrombotic um, or anticoagulant therapies in Explorus compared with Orbit. Uh, just over half of patients were taking OAC in Explorus. Um, warfarin use was higher in, um, in all uh, OAC users compared with NOACs, again, likely due to the time period. And we were not able to calculate event rates, unfortunately, due to the lack of person time. So with that, we'll turn it over to our last presenter of the day, Lauren Cohen, who will tell us about Pocorna. Thanks. And I think I'm already hooked up. Is that okay? All right. All right, great. So um, I, I'm Lauren. I'm going to talk a little bit about Pocorna and how this fits into the picture here. And so I'm not going to be presenting results of a study per se, but want to spend time talking about the Pocorna approach to data, which is a little bit different. Okay, so first of all, to bring back a slide that Tracy showed early on, this is how we sort of see the landscape of these data networks. And you can see that, again, both Explorus and Pocornet, we think, are both highly integrated and highly scalable. But they also differ in certain ways, so I'll focus on some of those. So this is a, a frightening slide um, that depicts the Pocornet landscape of data partners. So Pocornet comprises, well, many different things, but in terms of data, 13 clinical data research networks, or CDRNs, and these have, actually right now, 81 network data partners. And these little yellow dots here are our data repositories, our data networks. And in some cases, there's a one-to-one -one mapping with a hospital or health system. In other cases, there's data coming from a lot of different places. So I hear they can't see me if I go back there. Um, coming from hospitals, federally qualified healthcare centers, private clinics, et cetera. But all of these have worked to transform their data to a common data model. So, and what that means is, first of all, it's based on the Sentinel common data model that a lot of folks will be familiar with. But we're now on version four of the Pocornet common data model. So we've been working with sites to transform their data so that, let's say, one, in one case means, you know, you're a white American. Another, they say, Caucasian, et cetera. We've transformed it all to mean the same thing. All right. So looking here, it is a little bit of a puzzle. So right now, the common data model um, has been deployed across all these sites. And the elements shown in green are those that we have really good data on consistently. So we have demographic data mapped consistently. But in other cases, we have, let's say, tumor registry data at some sites, but not others. Uh, we have genomic data at some sites, but not others. So this is very much a work in progress. Okay, but getting to the good stuff now. Um, so as I was saying, we have good data across a lot of our network partners. So the majority have demographic data, enrollment data, encounter data. But let's say patient reported outcomes, or PROs, only about 9% have mapped data there. The fields exist. But again, going back to something Tracy said, in the US, we're not great at turning patients to participants. We're also not great at figuring out what patients want in their medical record. So these PRO fields remain empty. All right, so one thing that differentiates the Cornet is the amount of time that a team, a lot of who are in the room today, uh, spend on curating the data. So, as I mentioned earlier, we're now on version four of the common data model. 
And over time, that means we've had three different cycles before this. And each time, we get a little bit better at working with all of the partners in the network to say, well, how are your data? Why do you have encounter IDs without encounters, for example? Um, why do you have dates that are in the future? Something's probably wrong there. But over time, you can see that these have improved. Even from cycle two to three, um, just looking at future dates, that's been halved. So we're never going to have perfect EHR data. That's something about all EHR sources. But here, at least, we can work with partners to say, you know, we're seeing some weird things in your data. Let's fix it. That is something that's a little different. Um, <clears throat> here, these are completeness data. The last one's plausibility. So again, just looking at number of complete records. Um, to take one, for example, we, um, within Pocornet, you can never say for sure if your data are right or wrong. Again, same with all EHR records. There's some things that are probably always wrong, like future dates. Um, however, you never really know how many inpatient visits you should have. So what we do is we set thresholds and say, well, based on history, based on similar sites, we believe that this is a reasonable threshold that your data should fall around. So that over time, again, that's gone down so that we only have about 10% of records that are a little fishy. So we've done all this and mapped the data. And for those of you that haven't sat through a Pocornet talk before, the way this works is all the data stays at the network partners. And what the coordinating center does here is we write queries, send them to the network partners, they execute the query there, so all data stays behind their firewall, and they send back results. It makes it very secure. And the other thing that this does is it allows the local site to be able to reach out to those patients, for example. So we can link our data to people. And in terms of people, there's a lot of them. Um, as of May of this year, about 128 million patient encounters um, who have an encounter in the past five years. So again, there's some duplication here. If someone gets seen at more than one setting, we might not know about it and they're double counted. Regardless, it's, it's a large number of people. And of these, we have about 65 million who would potentially be eligible for a trial um, based on the fact that we can follow them at least at two points in time and a larger number for observational trials. Uh, looking at conditions, um, nothing too surprising here. We, um, like all EHR, um, have a lot of hypertensives um, and diabetics. Um, again, there could be some duplication, um, but it is a fairly representative population. And, and then the last thing, um, we've started really uh, delving into laboratory data recently, um, which is pretty messy. Um, but partly because there's so many records. Um, you know, one person has their A1C tested, you know, many, many times over the course of care. Um, so we are still working to clean these data up, but this is a really rich data source too. So, and I think with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Emily. Okay, so um, great. So we'll move to our, our panel discussion and we're going to um, maneuver in our our four skirts onto these comfortable stools. Um, okay, and um, we're happy to, to take any questions from, from the audience. Hi, could you describe how the business relationship with IBM Watson came about in um, collaborating on Explorers? I can take Dr. that. Dr. Wong. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's a very good question. They were, they, um, so I, you know, just to kind of put the, the, the data sources at context, you've got Pacornet where we're doing all the data curation, uh, working with sites proactively to set this up as a research network that is available to everyone um, to be able to access to the front door. And then you have organizations like IBM who are a little bit more commercially based who probably, probably has done a lot of the groundwork already in doing some of that data curation. We have a product that might be on the back end of things that is a little bit more um, research ready, or so they think. Um, and so this was actually a reach out from them to us to say, hey, 
can we take a look at these data? And we chose to do this without uh, involving an external sponsor to, to probe a particular question because we really wanted to understand what the capabilities of these type of data would be like and they wanted to understand what their data capabilities were, were, were like. And so, um, so it really uh, reflected a partnership between the two of us to, uh, to explore, sorry, the Explorers data. <laughs> So uh, as a researcher at DCI, how do we access the uh, PicoNet data? Sure. So um, there's two answers. One is the, you know, one DCRI answer, which is you can just call us and we will talk to you and help you and figure it out. Um, uh, technically, we also have what's called the PicoNet front door, which is simply an online portal. Um, you can get there from PicoNet.org, and that's where you can really start a conversation with a team. Uh, again, some of them are probably here today fill out a quick form and say, here's what I'm interested in, and then we'll work with you to, to figure out how to address your question, and if PCORNET's the right um, data source for your question. Shelby? Thanks. Um, you know, it is interesting to see how these um, commercial vendors really, you know, are re ready to go, ready to sell these data um, as, as though they've been validated. And that is really my question, is these comparisons are, are quite useful, but as you've shown, the event rates are much higher in, in the Explorers data set. And so to what extent is there actual validation being done to get back to those sites to determine whether people had those events or whether they're in the medical record um, to sort of justify a procedure or um, diagnostic test to rule out stroke, MI, and so forth. So I don't know about adjudication of events. I imagine that kind of thing is not happening. But they do talk a lot, or in the beginning when we were talking with the Explorers team, they talked about the harmonization and curation they do. And they do a lot of QC of that, they say. That said, they haven't published any of the metrics from that, which we did encourage them to do. I would love to see some of those metrics. We did at there because we probably because you know you do what you know and when, when we got into this we were using the ICD-9, ICD-10 codes and they really think in terms of SNOMED codes. They've mapped everything to SNOMED and really had encouraged us to use SNOMED. So so we did we did, we redid the whole thing using just SNOMED codes just to try to see how comparable they were and they actually lined up really nicely. So that was encouraging in terms of thinking about the mapping not completely informative. I might just add to that that I think there are lessons learned on, on both sides. And in fact, many of the lessons that you know we've talked with IBM about are things that we're going to need to figure out as well with um, PCORNET and with other sort of merged database resources. Um, the fact that we don't have a denominator to be able to truly say event rates, that's something that all of us are working towards. Um, trying to improve on because we really can't um, describe event rates if we can't appropriately censor patients um, when they either withdraw from a health system or don't come back into a health system or they've died and we don't know about that. Um, so I think those are, are clearly some of the issues that um, require iterative improvement. Uh, we'd like to think of these data sets as something that can really help us look at at the very least, treatment patterns, if not be able to do comparative effectiveness analysis. And one of the lessons we learned here was, yes, we can, in fact, surveil treatment, but we cannot actually establish um, how long patients were on treatment for, whether or not patients follow through on treatment. We can see a prescription. And uh, earlier on, someone made the comment, well, if you see a prescription for one month with 11 refills, why can't you just assume that the patient took 12 months of the treatment? Well, that's a big assumption to be, to be making. Um, and, and so the, these are some of the things that we're all learning in terms of how we think about these EHR data. Now, how they could certainly benefit from merging with other data sources like death and disease or like um, PBM data sources or when you get sort of more dispensing information. So, so all of these are, are going to, I hope, improve over time. So um, in most commercial um, insurance, the average is about two years. So is Explorus based on coverage, like what insurance they had or what facility they were at? 
more facility than insurance. These are contracts that they have with large health systems with different data feeds in. So some of these may be, in fact, payer-specific feeds in from those institutions, but largely they're with the facility rather than with the payer. And for, I think, both of them, if somebody, I think you've made reference to this, if they, if a same patient has care in multiple facilities, you can't really tell that. It would look like different patients having different care at different facilities. This is a common thing to a lot of these EHR data sets. I think PCORI has really worked on the deduplication process where we can be able to track someone, and Lauren, this may be something you could speak to. Um, Explorers, IBM tells us that they are doing something like that, but there's a lack of, um, there's a bit of a curtain between what we we know is happening versus what we hear is happening. So we don't exactly know what their deduplication process will be. Um, Lauren, from, from PCORnet's standpoint, I think yeah. this is definitely a big question. This is a big question in the context of a study, um, not in, in the context of generics we're looking at um, data estimates, but in the context of a study, we can create um, patient IDs in a, in a table and be able to match people, um, but it is a, a lot of work. And I would say that's part of the challenge for those of us who've, who've worked um, in both Explorers and PCORnet is that sort of lack of transparency, the traits you referenced. Um, the data characterization process has told us so much about what we're seeing and, and not seeing and whether patterns are consistent with what we'd expect. And that process happens completely independently um, from, from our team when we work with a, a commercial vendor. So um, we, we have a data set, um, but there remain a lot of questions about what went into that data set. And um, that's part of what we were trying to investigate with this process. Project. Jason, oh, I'll throw it out. If you're going to design your next registry, you know, based on everything you've learned and you have the access now to PCORnet, maybe Cerner and Explorus, <laughs> are you going to design something different? Absolutely. Okay. I, so I don't what are you think. And how could it be better? So. So just to quickly repeat the question, you know, now that we're sort of thinking about clinical trial design and knowing what we know here, do, do we design our trials differently? We, sh we have to, right? Because um, we should be moving towards improvement, not doing the same old thing every single time. Um, I think what's going to be really interesting for design before, you know, before we, you know, we kind of took the approach. Ideally, what is the best amount of information or what is the data variable that's so, so important to us that we just, well, whatever it is, we'll invest the effort into making sure that that outcome is, is tackled. And I think now we have to think a little bit more pragmatically. Um, we still want to preserve the science. We still want to make sure we're asking the right question and studying this, the right outcome. But we need to do a little bit more legwork in terms of being able to say, is this something that can be feasibly implemented? Because if it can't, then it probably can't be implemented um, later on when the trial results are out anyway. And, um, we have a bit more of an eye towards what do we do with the results after the study is complete. And I think that's a very healthy attitude when we're thinking about clinical trial design because at the end of the day, we're not designing these trials and saying, okay, in a vacuum, this is what um, therapy A versus therapy B means. What, what we want to do, be able to do is when we put therapy A into practice, how will it actually compare against therapy B? And so that in the practice, um, aspect of things is something that I think many of these data sets will help us realize how to um, help us improve how to design these trials. Great. Well, thank you so much to everyone for your attention today. Um, please join us next week. We have our very first research forum cage fight with um, Matt Rowe, Lane Thomas, and moderated by Kevin Anstrom. We'll be talking about causal inference and observational data. You don't want to miss it, so hope to see you there.